Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back. I can see that there are lots of familiar names in the list here. And um, a couple of new folks, perhaps. Um, again, this is the time where I, I apologize a little bit to folks who were really familiar with our intros because I'm going to repeat myself um, with a few introductions to, to get us all started. So my name is Haley Ross, for those of you who don't know me. And uh, I work with the Columbia Mountains Institute, or CMI for short. And I'm here with Kendall Benish with the KCP, um, or the Kootenai Conservation Program. And of course, we have joined forces for what has been a really great webinar series. And we're on our sixth talk today out of seven. So really trucking along. And um, what we've been doing, I'm just going to change my slide here so you can see what we have been doing and, and what's coming up. Um, is presenting a series on the theme of foundations of resilience, understanding departures from historical ecosystems and adapting for resilient futures. So we've had, or we will have had seven speakers who were drawing on patterns from the past, challenges in the present and scenarios for the future to explore adapting ecosystems for resilience in the Columbia Basin. This year's CRED Talks and KCP's winter webinar series are financially supported by the Columbia Basin Trust. So thank you very much to the trust for that support. And uh, today we'll be welcoming Eric Leslie, who is going to continue to talk about hands-on practical real life activities that we can do um, to increase resilience in our, in our ecosystems. And I'll introduce him in, in more detail in just a moment. Before I do that, however, I just wanna pause as we have been and acknowledge the Indigenous peoples and the land that uh, I am zooming in from today. So for myself personally, I'm in Revelstoke, BC, and this is the homeland of the Sinaiq people. And the Shikwapam people have also stewarded this land for millennia. The Tanaha call this valley where um, I'm privileged to live the land of the chickadee and in their, in their creation story. And the Tsiok uh, also express strong connections to this place. Um, so please, as we have been doing for the benefit of our speaker and, and for everyone else with us today, take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. So you can um, share your name, perhaps uh, the organization that you are working with and the Indigenous territories that you're Zooming in from today. It's a great opportunity to test out that chat. So if you can't find it, hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little ribbon pop up you can click on that chat icon and we'll probably you might have a chance you might be using that later for the q a which we'll talk about in just a sec <clears throat> so as those start to roll in i'm gonna keep going and tell you a little bit about one of your host organizations cmi so um columbia mountains institute is a nonprofit association for people working in the various fields of ecology our home range is Southern British Columbia, Canada, but our membership extends into Alberta, up north, uh, into the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. And one of the main things we do is provide professional development opportunities. So such as webinars, of course, uh, courses, workshops, conferences, and they tackle a variety of subjects um, ranging from sort of really technical skill-based activities to more complex topics that have to do with land management conundrums, and those tend to show up in our conferences. Our website, of course, is, the great, is a great place to learn more about what we do and um, has really great resources, such as recordings from these talks and preceding documents from our, our larger events. So I encourage you to check that out. That's at cmiae.org. So I'm just going to pass it over to Kendall. Thank you, Haley. My name is Kendall Benish, and I'm joining you on behalf of Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP. KCP's work occurs in the unceded, ancestral, and traditional territories of the Tanaha, Shikwetmik, Sinaiks, and Silks Okanagan peoples who've lived here and cared for the land, water, and wildlife since time immemorial. KCP is a broad partnership of 85 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, Indigenous nations, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producers working throughout the East and West Kootenays. And our mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and to generate the support and resources needed to maintain those efforts, which includes building technical knowledge through webinars like this. 
We're very excited to be hosting this webinar series with CMI and would like to give an additional thanks to our program sponsors, without whom we would not be able to support this type of work. So just a couple of final housekeeping details and then we'll get started. As you've noticed, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted to the event webpage within a week and you're welcome to share it widely. And we ask that you all remain muted unless you're asking a question during the Q&A at the end of the talk. And we'll be using the chat function for the Q&A. So you're welcome to add in questions to the chat anytime, but we won't be addressing those questions until uh, the end of the talk. And that's it from me, back to you, Haley. Great, thanks, Kendall. Okay, so now for the reason that you're all here today. So let's introduce Eric Leslie. He's gonna be contributing a talk called Climate Adaptation and Action for the Harrop Proctor Community Forest. And what I would like to do is uh, just read a short bio. So Eric is a forestry consultant and a manager. Oh, sorry, I need to advance my slide. There we go. Eric is a forestry consultant and a manager of the Harrop Proctor Community Forest near Nelson, BC. He has worked with community organizations forest industry, indigenous peoples, and re regional and provincial governments on projects from Haida Gwaii to Labrador. Eric has, an extensive experience, has extensive experience in forestry planning and operations, community engagement, and small business management. For decades, Eric's work has focused on community-based strategies to address climate change and reduce wildfire risk. So Eric, thanks so much for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. I'll pass it over to you. Super, thank you, Haley. Hello, everybody. Just going to queue up my presentation here. Okay, can you see that? Yep, that's good. Okay, super. So uh, I'm a forestry consultant, uh, but I've been working for the Community Forest and Hare Proctor for 17 years. Uh, as the manager. So I'm gonna be speaking with my uh, my, hat, my hair proctor forest manager hat on. I also do other consulting work and mostly in the West Kootenays these days uh, related to the kind of material I'll be talking about here. Okay, so here we are. Uh, for those of you who are uh, not super familiar with the location of the West Arm of Kootenay Lake, um, zooming in, there we are. Uh, Hare Proctor Community Forest is, you'll see Nelson in the bottom left corner. Uh, the community forest runs from West Arm Park, which runs all the way from Nelson to the pink outline. The community forest runs from there all the way over to Kootenay Lake. Uh, at the north end, it's all private land uh, that goes up a uh, moderate ways up the hillside. So the community forest it's about 11,300 hectares and it goes all the way from close to the lake to the height of land. Includes four main watersheds, including Harrop Creek and Proctor Creek. The, another big one is Narrows Creek. Uh, they're all watersheds that the folks in Harrop Proctor drink out of. There are about six to 800 people in the Harrop Proctor area. And other than a couple people who are on wells, uh, everybody's drinking straight out of the creeks, typical Kootenai situation. Uh, our forests are fire origin almost entirely from turn of the previous century fires. Uh, and the landscape you can see there in the photo is uh, typical of our area, unless it has recently burned uh, a vast green, green carpet of a hundred year old forest. And of course, fire has been excluded from the landscape until very recently. So a little context so on the social side for the community forest. Uh, the community forest was born out of the war in the woods of the 80s and 90s. Uh, these are photos taken at a major protest in Harrop uh, in 91, I believe, 91, 92, the year before Clackwood Sound erupted. Uh, so that's the backstory. There was industrial uh, logging planned in the in the watersheds and a lot of people were not very comfortable or happy with that idea and there were blockades. This is, I call this sort of the phase of sort of black and white uh, pro versus con um, forestry logging environmentalism. Uh, and that is the origin of our community forest because uh, 
um, I'll just go back here, because the community forest is a watershed-based group, and I'll get to that in a, in a second. Uh, just switching back to the land for a second, here's, here's a zoom in of what our forests look like uh, 20 years ago. A lot of them still look like that. Uh, the dense hundred-year-old forests, you can see in that slide, a little bit of mountain pine beetle cropping up in the headwaters of uh, Proctor Creek there, if your resolution is good enough. And yeah, so fire has returned to our landscape. After no major fires from the 30s until 2003, there was a big fire in the Tidal Creek, burned into the headwaters of Harrop Creek and, and uh, threatened the community, was on evacuation alert for several weeks. That was the same year as the Kelowna wildfire and many others. And then another big wildfire year, there was a lightning strike just in the top right corner of this uh, image actually, ended up burning about 3,000 hectares, uh, mostly in the community forest. So yeah, fire's back and I'll be talking about that. Okay, now I'm going back to the social side. So the, the, following the war in the woods, a park was created, West Arm Park, and it excluded the watersheds of Harrop and Proctor, uh, which was a bit ironic for the people who had been protesting uh, and advocating for a park. And the community forest was actually originally a plan B for, for many of those folks. And it just so happened that in the late 90s, there was an opportunity uh, in the first uh, NDP government's uh, go around to, to there was an opportunity to apply for a community forest, which was a brand new program at the time, it was a pilot program. So a, uh, the Watershed Protection Society organized itself and put in a three inch uh, binder, uh, applying along with dozens and dozens of other communities across the province. And the community forest was the second one awarded in the province. Um, we are now a not-for-profit cooperative. That's how we're structured. We have over 280 members. Remember that there's only maybe 800 people living here Proctor in the summer. So we have quite a large, maybe 250 to 300 households in the community. Um, our objectives coming out of the, the, the watershed-based advocacy, water protection, uh, drinking water protection has always been number one. And uh, very tightly linked with our ecosystem-based forestry approach, which I'll be talking about. Local employment has always followed behind that. We do have a small sawmill in Harrop, as well as all the local forestry employment that is generated from our small business. And community wildfire protection has been a big issue, not surprisingly, for the past 20 years. And in 2010, uh, we put, we wrote climate change adaptation into our uh, goals and objectives as well. Okay, that's the context. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking for the rest of the presentation about a project that I've been leading in the community forest for the past several years that is about taking the broad concepts of adaptation, uh, climate change adaptation, wildfire risk reduction, that sort of thing, and operationalizing it in our community forest as a, a pilot study. We received funding, uh, well, the project received funding from the community forest and from Columbia Basin Trust. And through the Columbia Basin Trust uh, funding, there's a significant outreach component uh, of which this presentation could be considered uh, a part. So I think most people on this uh, webinar will agree that there is lots and lots of talk and concerns and ideas about climate change and what to do about it. I have found that there is not very much systematic action, at least in the forestry sector, not yet, despite the fact that it's been a, something we've been talking about for 10 or 15 years quite extensively. So the objective of what I'll be speaking about is to try to connect the theory and the broad principles of climate change adaptation with actual examples of what it could look like on the ground. Okay, so for example, you see, you see, you'll see a lot of promote resilient species as guidance to forest managers. Well, okay, which species and where, based on what ecosystems? Uh, partial cut dry sites, well, what does that mean partial cut, uh, where and how, that sort of thing. So that's what I'll be getting into. So that's what this project is about. It's sort of a zooming into a specific land base as a pilot uh, study. 
there was, uh, there is a project advisory committee uh, for the project, especially in the, uh, the startup phase. I won't list everyone who's on the committee. You can see them here, they include consulting uh, ecologists and foresters and biologists, um, as well as Ministry of Forests uh, staff and uh, industry representatives as well, small, medium and large industry. So the idea was that it would be, you know, big ecological brains in behind it to help me as a manager, uh, make sure that what I was doing was on track with the ecology of our area, as well as government and industry uh, folks to keep it uh, real and applied. Okay, there's a couple of premises. I'm not, this is the only slide that's going to, well, maybe oh, there's only two slides about <laughs> that actually show climate change on a graph. Uh, I'm not even going to get into the specifics because people have seen slides like this so much. Uh, this slide here shows the increase in spring flows uh, in Redfish Creek, which is right across the west arm from, from Narrows Creek in the community forest. You know, April flows up 73%, September flows down 42%. That's the kind of thing that scares a lot of us uh, for obvious reasons. So this is the last slide I'll have about, about climate science uh, in this presentation. I just put it into four bullets. This is what the science uh, provincially and, and uh, local regional experts um, downscaling climate models have, have given me. Um, warmer, potentially likely wetter uh, springs uh, falls and winters and drier, hotter summers, more average annual area burned as we're seeing and more extreme precipitation events and extreme events in general. Okay, that's, that's the context. The, 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 the premise is we know all that already. The other premise that we have is, that I have, is that we already have enough high level direction uh, from the province, from regional folks, from big, uh, industry, everyone's got a, a strategy, but most of the strategies are still at very high level in my experience. And the other premise is that the values and the concerns of the community forest, which has been in operation for over 20 years, those haven't changed. You know, they're still um, protecting domestic water, trying to have some local sustainable jobs, maintain biodiversity and protecting the community from wildfire. That's that's what it's all about. So that is not the objectives change, it's, it's how we try to address them. So I'll be talking about the three parts of, of our project. Um, one is risk assessment, which I'll be getting into. I'll go through that fairly quickly, uh, but uh, it's very important. Operation strategy is, is probably what most people will find the most relatable, which is getting into examples of how we're applying adaptation on the ground and in the watersheds. And I'll touch briefly on our management planning and uh, annual allowable cut scenarios. So, you know, the, I have a how, a where, a how, and a how fast as, this, as the questions, because the risk assessment is really about prioritizing areas uh, because there's so much change happening on the landscape. It can be overwhelming. It is overwhelming. And we need to, do triage in some cases to uh, decide where to put our energy because we only have so much uh, time and, and resources. So risk assessment, I used a standard risk assessment um, methodology looking at probability and, and consequence. Probability specifically in this case of fire and drought and consequence to the four values of, of primary concern in the community force. You could have other values that you could uh, be following as well, but I kept it relatively uh, streamlined for this purpose, the sort of a proof of concept approach. Okay, don't worry about this slide if you don't like slides like this. I'm just sort of orienting where this risk assessment is in relation to hazards and values. Uh, if you're really interested in this, I suggest you look at the recording of this uh, presentation later and, and look in detail. I just thought I'd throw it up here because some people really like this slide and probably most people don't. So it's in there. Uh, it's, it's showing where the risk assessment fits. Okay, risk doesn't exist without a value at risk. So that's the four values that we're, that we're mapping. So I'm sticking, um, first I'm looking at the consequence side of the, of the risk 
uh, assessment. Water values, low, moderate, high. Um, this is primarily thinking about drinking water values. Uh, you'll can see that the high value areas, the areas where if they were impacted, the consequences would be high. Those areas are headwaters areas and riparian areas primarily because that's the, the areas that most strongly influence uh, water uh, quantity and quality and, and timings of flow. Timber values, very different location on the landscape. They're closer to the community, they're higher volume stands, um, they have potential for access or they have access. Um, they, they're in a very different place on the landscape than the water value. So anytime you look at someone with a single picture of a risk assessment, says this is the areas at risk, I strongly suggest looking at, okay, this is areas at risk in regards to which value, because the water values are in one place and the timber values are in a different place, just for example. Okay, now getting into the probability side of the risk equation. So we used uh, the actual soil moisture regime um, part of biogeographic uh, mapping um, and, so, and um, ecosystem science. I'll explain that very briefly. It, it, and we started by, by taking our terrestrial ecosystem mapping and, and, and uh, mapping the actual soil moisture of, of each of those sites. Now, this is where climate change comes in. Don't worry about the numbers. The colors kind of help you. Um, obviously, as it gets a warmer and drier, uh, the amount of moisture available to plants to grow in the growing season is becoming less, moisture, moisture, uh, drought stress is becoming higher. And so just if you just look at the top line here, you'll see um, previous climate or what's considered the current climate, but it's already passed. Um, you, you'll see some slightly less uh, scary colors. And then as we go into the 2085, um, you'll see that the same site drops from a four, which I've circled there as a sort of um, slightly dry to a moderately dry or significantly dry. And that happens all the way through all of our, all of our ecosystems. Each ecosystem uh, type that we have in our community forest we placed in this graph. You see each of them are getting drier, um, although the driest ones are the ones that are drying the most and the wettest ones aren't changing very much. So that's a, a key learning is that the areas that are already droughty are the ones that are having the stronger impacts. Uh, from climate change. And this is from the provincial modeling and local uh, um, provincial uh, ecologists. Okay, that last slide is kind of complicated. This is just to visualize it. Here's the CUNY forest, 11,000 hectares going from the lake to the height of land. Here's absolute soil moisture regime, 1990. Here it is, 2055. And here it is, 2085. So this is based on actual field-based science uh, sampling and um, done by ecologists. Okay, that's, our, that's the amount of drought that we have and are expecting on each of our sites. Then of course, each tree species has a different um, susceptibility to drought. For example, cedar is not very drought tolerant, uh, although it's more drought to tolerant than hemlock, but it's, you know, uh, fir, larch, and ponderosa are the are the, are the most uh, drought tolerant. So this is um, some work looking at individual species and what their drought tolerance is. Of course, as it gets drier, they get closer to the red zone, uh, many of them. So just one slide of the drought probability based on all that I've just been talking about. Here's uh, where, the, where drought is very likely to be significantly impacting the current tree species mix in 2085. So you take the drought levels, you take the tree species, this is what you end up with with risk. This points us towards the areas that are uh, likely to die off or be susceptible to other forest health issues um, in the coming decades. Okay, that was the drought piece. Now the fire piece, fire probability I'm defining as, as the likelihood of high severity fire occurring if fire touched that 
site. We've had lightning strikes all over the community forest, high elevation, low elevation, every valley. It it will likely strike in a ran it's it strikes in a close to apparently random pattern. Um, so I won't get into the specifics again, but we looked at the fire probabilities based on fuels and, and uh, slope aspect, that kind of thing, and whether it was a dead forest or not currently. Uh, a lot of red there. Uh, the only part that isn't uh, red is the area that has already burned, or a few wet sites, or the pink in the northern portion there are, are previously harvested, primarily partial cut sites which have got now got lower uh, densities and and more uh, sustainable species on them okay this is the slide that i said 10 minutes ago beware of uh it's the slide that summarizes the entire risk assessment into one slide so we're mashing together all the values and all the probabilities to point us towards the areas that on in aggregate are at highest risk of uh, impacts uh, from climate change. Interestingly, these areas are primarily at lower elevations, primarily on uh, droughty sites, coarse textured soils, uh, that's that sort of thing. Okay, end of the risk assessment stuff, that tends to be the wonky stuff. Um, we have certain areas that it points out are the highest risk uh, values to us and uh, the locations of them, because this is, a, this is prioritizing certain areas for management. Now we're gonna get into the, the how. Okay, this is, this is the stuff that's a little more tangible. I'm gonna talk about the operation strategy given where the risks are located and what those risks are. So I have found it recently very helpful to think of the different types of strategies we can choose to use in relation to the threats posed or the risks from climate change. We can choose resistance type strategies, which are more protecting what we have, especially if it's of high value. And or we can choose a realignment or transition strategy, um, which is more of a proactive accepting that change will happen and potentially um, not exactly facilitating it, but, but working with the change that's coming. So if we are resisting, uh, we don't want a fire to burn down homes. We don't want a fire to burn down high value uh, old growth forests, for example. So we might be putting fuel breaks around those areas. <clears throat> we will be protecting old and riparian forests. We'll have reserve networks. On the reali uh, realignment side, re which is really um, works hand in hand with the resistance side or it's the flip side, um, we're looking at actively changing forest structure, new stocking standards, that sort of thing. Which I'll so I'll talk about examples of both of these in a sec. Okay, I find this slide also helpful. Um, it's, resilience is there in the middle between resistance and transition um, as you move towards facilitating adaptive responses or promoting change. Uh, resilience, I find, is a word that's used very heavily. And in the context of what we're talking about here, I think it's helpful to think of resilience in a large landscape context, not on a site by site context. Whereas we can think of resistance or transition more at the site level or at the landscape level. Um, and I throw this out there because uh, uh, the USDA uses this concept quite a bit and I find it uh, quite helpful. Okay, operations, uh, operations strategy. So, um, the context is that a resistance approach is sort of like uh, rowing upstream or swimming upstream. Um, however, it's worth doing at times. Um, let's talk about carbon. Let's talk about mature forests, uh, old forests. We want to have lots of carbon kept on the landscape, ideally. We would like to have lots of older forests around, ideally. Um, however, if you look at the current uh, the, and future carrying capacity of our sites in the southern interior uh, in relation to carbon or old trees, there is a capacity issue here and the capacity is, is dropping. Uh, the maximum conifer, uh, maximum carbon um, stocks in our community forest was in 2003 before the wildfire and the pine beetle. It's been dropping ever since, has nothing to do with our logging. 
or maybe two percent of its ass. The, the rest of it is, is these natural changes. So we have to think a lot about where we can hold carbon, where we can resist. Okay, this is our from our management plan. Um, we have sixty to seventy percent of our land base in reserves already. The the upper elevations are caribou habitat. Uh, they're inoperable, hard to get to. There's some old growth in there that we are not going to disturb. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we can't work or shouldn't work or have chose not to work in the upper elevation. So the context of all of our operations is that we're not going to be operating in a large portion of the community forest. However, you will see that the green areas on this map very closely align with the highest risk areas in the community forest in terms of our values. So that gives us an opportunity to be proactive in some of these areas. Okay, on the resist resistance side of the spectrum of adapting to climate change. Fuel, fuel breaks, fuel treatments, that's a fairly obvious one. Um, here, all the different shades of green are either completed or in progress uh, fuel treatment areas where we're trying to get a fuel break all the way across from Harrop in the left to Proctor on the right. In the community forest, these would be low fuel areas, whether that treatment's been done by, by hand or with machinery. And we also have some landscape level fuel breaks that we're, we're looking at building. I'll give some specifics. This is something I've been working on for over a decade. So a few examples. There's a couple of old roads in the community forest from the 60s uh, that provide access into areas that otherwise have no access. And uh, we, we're not an over-roaded landscape like some areas. We're uh, an area that has actually very few roads. Um, and without road access, there's not much ability to protect a watershed like Proctor Creek, which is all 100-year-old coniferous or older. Uh, forest, there's not much opportunity to protect it from a wildfire. We've built um, some helipads before they're needed because I've worked on fires and uh, specifically the 2017 fire and it's like, where's the roads, where's the helipads? Here's a couple of examples of fire guards that were built during the 2017 wildfire that I laid out. On the top one, it's part of a two kilometer guard that went along the ridge and then the bottom one's part of a four kilometer guard that went across slope. This is fairly straightforward uh, stuff here. Uh, here's a image of what some of those landscape fuel breaks uh, look like in terms of their location. The fire is in the, the background there. You can see the 2017 machine guard did not, it stopped the fire from moving further north into the community. This is all just proactive forestry planning here. Aerial view of what a fuel break could look like. Uh, this is one we, install, we, we put in about uh, over 10 years ago now. Okay, realignment. There's a beautiful fur vet, probably 300 years old, 250 anyways, multiple fire scars, and uh, obviously was not surrounded by young uh, cedar for a large portion of its life, but it is now. Here's a note, uh, a location in the wildland urban interface within couple hundred meters of people's homes. We have big-ish fur and large, but we also have very heavy uh, uh, cedar hemlock understory and mid canopy fuels that, on a site that is getting drier. So we need to think about what we can do about these sites, you know. So, so if we take this site, um, very dense, uh, continuous fuels horizontally and vertically and the cedar and hemlock that's on this site is not well suited at all to the climate that we're already getting and that we're going to be having. So what do, what, what's our desired future condition on this site if we choose to manage it? Again, don't worry about specifics, but we're looking at targeting certain species and densities, fuel loads, reserve uh, areas, that kind of thing, with specific targets of how much area we want to cover in our timber harvesting land base, which is the area we might potentially work in over the next couple of decades. Here's an example of that one site. Uh, it's a partial cut harvest done a few winters ago. Um, lower slide is what it looked like just after, just after that partial cut. This is sort of a, in, in the nomenclature of that last graph I showed, sort of somewhere between, I would say, sort of resistance and resilience um, with a little bit of realignment. <laughs> um, here's what it looks like a year later. 
after uh, some pile burning and a and, um, little bit of cleanup, uh, fires in the 2017 fires in the background. Here's another site uh, in Harrow Creek West Basing site. It was primarily a uh, dead pine. 15 years ago, uh, we went in and removed the dead and dying pine and some of the understory cedar hemlock left the larger, healthier fir larch. So this is a partial cut stand. This, is, this stand has now been, it's now as ready as it can be for future fire and, and drought. Also, when you're, when you're doing this uh, work, you need to think about the connectivity of your work. So this is, if you're on getting on the Herrick Ferry, you, this is what you would see if it wasn't winter time. <laughs> There's some logging there uh, in the middle, partial cut. In fact, the last photo was taken from that spot. And then there's a landscape level fuel break that is we're working on to go up um, up the ridge between West Arm Park and, and the community. Okay, uh, now a couple slides from uh, other areas where I work. I also work for the Slocan Community Forest, um, which is also a not-for-profit watershed-based co-op. Uh, I've been working specifically on reintroduction of fire into that landscape, working on some ecosystem restoration and, and welfare risk reduction plans and operations. This is a burn uh, that the BC Wildfire Service in cooperation with the Sulcan Community Forest pulled off uh, two years ago, coming on two years ago uh, on a dry south facing slope. This is another project I've worked on uh, with BC Parks. Um, we, this is just up at the back end of Svoboda Road, just a mile outside of Nelson. We did a partial cut in a pine uh, fir larch cedar hemlock mix, and then we uh, did an understory burn. Uh, BC Wildfire Service carried out the burn. Uh, the biologist and uh, consulting forester, such as myself, came up with the plan um, with BC Wildfire Service to do a light understory burn. Okay, also stocking standards. That's often talked about in forestry. Oh yeah, we're doing stuff about climate change. We're we're, we've got some different stocking centers, which is great. It's one piece of it. Um, so I've worked on uh, both partial cut and even age stocking standards uh, for the West Kootenays. Uh, this is an example of uh, partial cut stocking standards. This is when if you go in and you, you are logging on a site and you uh, may have a, an objective of regeneration, what is the standard that you're trying to meet? Obviously now we're looking at trying to have a more drought and fire tolerant uh, landscape in areas that are prone to drought and fire such as this ecosystem here. Um, Here's some tree planters. Uh, top right is the, you know, what a lot of our uh, stands look like. And bottom right is just some uh, ponderosa pine. We have started, geez, 13 years ago, 12 years ago, started planting our first ponderosa pine in the community forest just to mix in with the fir and larch. Ponderosa pine is entirely native, but is very uh, quite uncommon due to the history of fire exclusion in the community forest. Okay, last step, I'm only gonna have one slide on this one. Um, so we've talked about the risk assessment, so the prioritization piece. We've talked about the operations strategy, which is the what exactly are we gonna do where piece. And uh, now there's also the question, well, how fast do we wanna do this? Uh, in terms of if the doing this involves going in and thinning stands and that. Um, there's no simple answer to that. I believe that cut level, annual allowable cut is a social choice based on which values are most of concern and what the risks are, and we have to make a decision. So we're currently uh, running scenarios of what uh, higher uh, drought levels and mortality as a re result of drought uh, will, what the impacts of that are likely to be on the timber supply and uh, hence the long-term viability of, our, of the, you know, the business side of our community forest. Um, and so we're, we're looking here at sort of how fast do we want to move? And I won't get into the answer, like if someone has a question about that, I'd be happy to talk about that. It gets pretty technical, but essentially we need to be looking at timber supply from a scenario-based uh, approach, not just a, we have a black box that says how fast trees grow historically, and we'll just plug in our land base and it'll tell us what the sustainable cut is and we'll just do that same record, same amount for 250 years, which is how it 
traditionally timber supply is is conceived, that doesn't really make sense in the in the context of climate change, and it doesn't make sense in the southern interior in a in a small area based tenure. In my view. So this project, uh, I'm just wrapping up here. The this project has an outreach component. We've put together uh, a series of educational films, uh, four of them. Uh, they're on uh, YouTube. If you Google a hair proctor wildfire videos, uh, you can find them or on our website. Uh, there's a number of presentations that, that I'm giving and there will be a, a handbook that will be coming out describing this uh, in the coming few months. So that's my very, very fast run through of our project and our community forest, what we're doing about adapting to climate change. I, I went through it very fast and I apologize for, for those who may think it was too fast, but I wanted to leave time for questions and discussion and you know if you want uh to follow up with me as needed later that's also fine so i'm going to um stop sharing my screen now and ask haley if she can moderate or jump us into the questions here thanks eric that was great uh nice work I know it's a lot of material to cover and and you know some really complex stuff in there it's hard to i'm sure decide what to go over quickly and what to delve into in more detail um but you've left a lot of time for questions which is great so um we'll be able to fill in the blanks here now so um folks if you just came in a little bit later what we're doing is we are instructing people to put their questions in the chat um and then i'm going to relay questions to eric um, and we'll get to as many of them as best we can. Um, and just while we're waiting for questions to populate here, I'm sure there's gonna be no shortage of them. I'll just say that uh, some of those complex, more complex sort of charts and graphs that Eric said we've seen so many of uh, in relation to climate change. Um, if you haven't seen many of those and you are curious, last year's CRED Talks delved into that uh, quite deeply. So there were eight speakers, I believe, um, who focused specifically on climate disruption in the Upper Columbia. Um, so if you go to that same webpage, all those talk recordings are there and you could learn more about that. Um, okay, so let's start um, with this question. So it says, you work at a community forest. How has the local community responded to your climate change initiative? Yes, so, so this is one project with, which has a very large bearing on the direction our community forest is going. I've been the manager for 17 years. Climate change was not a big part of the discussion when, when I started working there, although wildfire was certainly starting to. Um, as a not-for-profit cooperative, where I think the majority of households in the community own a share of the business, um, it's a pretty well-informed community as a whole in terms of forestry issues. Um, so there's a lot of pre-existing knowledge and interest in general in the community in terms of forestry issues and, and climate change, uh, I think, uh, is on many people's minds. The fact that we've had two major wildfires in 20 years, putting the community on evacuation alert for multiple weeks each time, uh, definitely piques the interest and attention of everyone. Um, so the fact that this a, a significant portion of this project speaks to the wildfire issue is relevant uh, and, and draws a lot of people in. I, I, I find that the most valuable part is having these discussions around resistance and, and, and realignment and how we make those choices and understanding, uh, let's say, community wildfire protection in this, in this broader context. So I would say that there's, you know, it's, it's a community owned business. Um, the jobs are local, the risks are local, and it, it keeps it all close to home. So, you know, we we get a lot of interest, a lot of questions. People don't always want to come out to meetings, uh, but that's the nature of, I see Vicki Huva, who lives across the street from the office, and whose husband, uh, Terry, was on the board for many years, and I think Vicky was too, smiling. Uh, we Many, I see Katie Hill is also on the board, smiling. Uh, there's a lot of meetings in the community forest uh, side of things, and that's because it's a community-based uh, enterprise. So um, 
anyways, that, that's sort of an aside, but there's a lot of community interest in this work. Great, okay, thanks, Eric. Um, so I'll just, I just wanna add that um, as I read out these questions, if I pronounce something wrong or you wanna add in another detail or any such thing, please feel free to turn your camera on and unmute yourself and, and correct me in any way. Um, yeah, you're welcome to be interactive in this component. Okay, so I've got a question here from Tyne and she says, how often do you reevaluate the results of your investigations, or sorry, your um, interventions against the defined values? Mm. So sort of speaking to the uh, monitoring and maybe the adaptive sort of feedback uh, loop there. Um, we, any areas where we have been active on the landscape, meaning doing something, um, since our inception uh, 22 years ago, we go back to re repeatedly. There's not a single site that, that we've worked on that we've sort of said, okay, um, good enough or whatever. Um, partly that's because of civil culture concerns and, and, and requirements. Um, but we definitely are looking back, like what's the health of the trees that we left? Uh, how are the, the young trees doing? Are we getting the deciduous response that we're hoping to get? That's a big thing I didn't actually speak to it. Uh, we're often trying to encourage deciduous to come back in. Um, so we're quite closely uh, watching how, how that's happening. Um, and you know, because we've done a number of partial cuts and entries now for, for 20 years, we have, we're, we're learning as we go and saying, well, that didn't work so well there. Maybe that's because, uh, well, Wind, wind throw is an example, like we're really having to be careful around, on, around uh, wind throw, uh, either leaving area alone or accepting a certain amount of wind throw, um, really leaving the, the uh, most wind from trees in, in place. That's been a big adaptation we've had to make because the wind storms are also getting worse. So that, that's a big complicating factor. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like you're doing sort of really fine scale and then also, I guess, looking at the broad scale, once you add up all that fine scale together and the little adjustments. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking like a, a typical stand-based forester there uh, in answering that question, uh, because that's where so much of the work happens. We're also looking at, like you, look, you saw those maps of the entire community forest and how's our progress on the, the landscape level fuel breaks, you know, what percent are we done? Uh, how, uh, what's the age class and species distribution evolving to become through natural disturbance on the land base as a whole. We also do, uh, I should have mentioned this, we also do water monitoring on all of our main creeks. So we have uh, for Hare Creek and Narrows Creek, close to 20 years of water monitoring data. I should have mentioned that earlier. So we are also see, watching the flows and how they're responding to, to climate change and fires and, and our work and that sort of thing. Great, thanks, Time. Thanks, Eric. Um, okay, so I have a question here from Mark and Mara. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, we stopped by the HP Community Lumber Mill and we saw that you have some biochar kilns on site. We're interested in the possibility of biochar financing some of these needed forestry advances. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, we've been, so we have a small sawmill, uh, which, has uh, slabs that are uh, produced. And we, for on one side of the equation, we have to do something with them um, because they're a waste product from the sawmill. Um, so, uh, and of course, biochar can be used as a soil amendment. And um, we have done some uh, experimentation down at the mill. I'm not the expert on it. You'd want to talk to uh, David Strom, actually, is the person down at the mill who maybe you spoke to about this. Uh, we've got a couple of small. Uh, uh, burners and we're experimenting with, uh, you know, um, how feasible it is to be making biochar as uh, a way to turn a waste product into a, into a useful product with minimal uh, smoke. Um, so it's, 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 not, it's at the investigation stage, it's not at a, you know, there's not a strong business case figured out for it yet, but that we're actively working on that um, as as part on our sawmilling side of our operation. And I'll also mention, you could also be bringing some of that biochar, you could be bringing it back into the woods, you know, that's as a soil amendment in the woods, um, although it's primarily used, right now it's being used like mixed with chicken manure to go on people's gardens, that kind of thing. 
It's neat. Thanks. Okay, question from Angela. Um, do you have areas where you focus on one of the specific values to determine the efficacy of the different intervention or treatment on the separate values? Yeah, that's a good question because you know we 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 we've, we've got four main values that we're that I'm talking about. So let's take water and timber are maybe the most easy to contrast um, because of their different location and different ways you can manage for them typically. Um, we definitely part of the, the I didn't show the sort of thought process algorithm for each uh, sort of site, but we look at which in which area uh, in which areas are where do the where are the values most significant? So in in, in a riparian area or uh, for example, water is going to be the most important value right next to someone's house on a dry site. Uh, wildfire, I mean, uh, houses are going to be the most significant um, values. So we definitely have a, a higher and lower um, um, priority on those different values, depending on the location. Every location is different. Um, so the, the, you know, the water value exists throughout the community forest, although certain sites are really, for example, like a, a coarse textured uh, north or west aspect uh, site at low to mid elevations in our watersheds is not um, highly um, impact, does not highly, what happens on the site does not actually highly impact our, our peak flows or our low flows. Um, um, it doesn't impact the quality of the water unless it's a high uh, landslide risk area. So areas like that, water is an important value, but we're we would have to make sure we have a high degree of confidence that we're not going to compromise that value by doing our timber management or our fire management. So I would say water is the one that we can't ever sort of drop off. Timber is is relevant whenever it's a there's timber being extracted, but in many cases the timber is a byproduct of a fuel treatment and it's not really the driving force. However, we need to not lose money, so we either need to you know except that we'll lose some money or make the money somewhere else or, or get funding programs uh, to help us pay for that sort of thing. So yeah, every single uh, watershed and every single site is, has a different balance of values. Yeah, it's not simple. <laughs> no, it's not simple, that, but that's what makes it fun, right? That's what makes it really interesting. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is what I'm going to suggest. Denise, you have a fairly long comment and a bit of a question. I want you to think about what your question is, and then um, we're going to circle back to you. So I'm going to ask them Shauna's question. I'm going to relay that one. And then Denise, I suggest that you unmute yourself when we're ready. I'll call on you and then and you can ask your question. OK, so let's go to Shauna. So we're exploring values based management at a landscape level and using adaptive management or mitigation to manage for competing values. Do you have an example of competing values in your risk assessment and prioritization of actions or planning for those competing values? Yes. Okay. Uh, one example would be an old growth forest um, that is near the community or that is close or part of an area that's a high priority for a landscape level fuel break. So here we have a rare ecosystem type with specific uh, biodiversity values, uh, which may or may not be compatible with any kind of uh, active forest management. So we um, are definitely uh, picking some sites, like the, 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 let's say the more cedar hemlock old growth forest, not that we have much of it at all, um, we committed to not ever going into uh, any of those stands unless it was an extremely light treatment along an existing edge or something very specific. Um, so you have to make your, your choices there. Um, even if you'd like to reduce the risk in that stand because it's of its rarity as an older forest, um, we will, there are certain cases where we're, we just won't. Uh, but what we're doing is in that case, there's some of those stands, well, well, there's actually a dry site just adjacent that's fine on the ridge. And if we do a fuel treatment there, we reduce the risk of fire impact that old growth stand in the first place. And we can get our landscape level fuel break in by through avoiding that, that old growth forest. 
Um, there are also, there's also one small area of a west facing slope with more of a fir larch, not very old forest, but a little bit old forest where we're actually, it has cedar headlock undergrowth and we're um, doing a fuel treatment in there, uh, maintaining all the old forest values um, while doing a fuel treatment because in that case, they're compatible. Um, they're not always compatible, but sometimes they are compatible because of the forest structure um, and the fact that this was historically a, more of a fire maintained or load mixed severity fire location, um, a certain amount of uh, fuel treatment is um, defensible, in fact, desirable to improve the resilience of a site like that. Um, so there's sometimes there's tensions uh, that work together and sometimes there's tensions that, that, that don't work together and you just have to make your choice. Right, and so so the societal values are what what make that shift and change in choice to accept yeah, so, the risk. Or yes, so we we have mapped where the water values are the highest. So those are the areas where we'll place the top priority on on water. Um, it's not that we won't manage for other things at the same time, but that that's going to be at the top. Um, and yes, it is a social choice. Ultimately, most of these things are social choices. Even our choice to manage for old growth um, or biodiversity or, or water, they're, they're ultimately, they boil down to choices that people are making. Um, and the way I rationalize that a little bit or understand that is that we managed our way into this situation by excluding fires and creating climate change. So like it or not, the landscape we have out my window and out everyone else's window is impacted by human activity. Um, so we we got ourselves here. Now we have we don't we can't wash our hands and say, well, we'll just stay away from it now and that'll be good. Maybe it will be, maybe it won't, but that's not a very um, certainly not proactive, and I don't think it's actually a responsible way to think about about our ecosystem. Um, you know, we got ourselves here, we got to make active management decisions to get out. Even if those active management decisions are, we're not going to do anything and we'll accept the risks of the of natural disturbances. That's fine, but that's a decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, so we're, we're short on time now. It's 12.59. We were going to aim to end by one, but let's, I'll stay good on my promise. Denise, why don't you share your question now? And then I think we'll cut it off from there. Ian does have a question in the chat. Um, and uh, if we don't get to that one, I'll I'll make I'll send it to Eric by email. Yeah. Okay. okay, so Denise, are you there? Yep. Okay, go for it. Thanks very much, everyone. And thank you, Eric, for a great talk and all the work you're doing. Um, bottom line, in a nutshell, we can't afford the carbon emissions from slash burning. I also don't think it should be called slash, but um, residue or something. So I know it's better than a full on forest fire for carbon emissions, but why can't we um, chip in C2 or come up with other ways that are not slash burning to deal with this potential fire hazard and reduce emissions and increase our costs so we're not having the softwood lumber dispute with the states from our subsidization, no? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. And we're definitely doing everything we can so far to reduce burning through, for example, increased utilization of low value materials going to the, um, going to the pulp mill rather than burning them on site. Um, through, uh, we have done a small amount of chipping. Unfortunately, most of our sites are too steep to physically get a chipper that we can really have access onto that site. Um, the, so the, we're, we're doing what we can and we definitely have reduced the burning significantly. Um, we have to make a choice at times to choose to, to emit a uh, relatively limited amount of carbon now to try to reduce a large amount of carbon emissions later. Just for context, in three days, the Herrick Proctor wildfire, the 2017 wildfire burned in three days more land than our community forest has even touched in 20 years. 
you know, the scale of what we're doing versus the scale of what a wildfire can done and has done in 20 years in our community forest, it's just like, it's like a million to one almost, at least 10,000 to one, you know, in terms of uh, on, a, on a daily or yearly uh, impact as far as what we're doing. So we, we just have to, I agree, we, we have to absolutely be, be um, doing our best, but we also have to consider where can we carry carbon on the landscape and where is carbon above what the landscape can, can hold in the long term. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to sneak this question in, see if you can give a quick answer. <laughs> okay. So Ethan asks, given birch decline in the region, do you think it would, do you think it should have a place in our WRR regeneration or deciduous field break efforts? You know, I haven't given up on birch. Yes, it, it has been declining heavily and it's impacted by a lot of things, including drought. Um, we're always going to have birch around and even if it only lasts for 20 or 30 years before it dies, that still is a great thing. It's great for the soil. Uh, it's great for the risk reduction. It's great for wildlife. Um, I don't think we should count on just birch. You know, in most cases, it's birch and aspen, birch and aspen and uh, deciduous shrubs, non-tree species. Um, so we don't count on it as a timber species or count on it as to carry everything, but definitely birch, I think has, personally, I feel it has a place. Uh, on our, it always has, and I think it always will. Just like lodgepole pine, it's always been here. It'll never go away. It's a tough, tough tree. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's a lot to tackle, but you did great. Um, I'm just going to take over the screen share here briefly and do some formal thank yous and wrap up. Um, thanks everybody for contributing to, um, well, being here for one thing, and contributing to the discussion and the questions. Um, this is probably the point, Eric, when you want to look at the chat because you'll have some accolades coming in, I'm sure. Um, so just a thanks from CMI, thanks from KCP and our funders. So uh, we have the Columbia Basin Trust, of course, and then all of KCP's core funders that allow them to do their very important work. So many thanks. And a bit of a teaser for our very last talk. So next week, um, we're ending on a bit of a different note. So we've been talking a lot about fire um, with regards to ecosystem resilience. And next week, we're going to go and we're going to talk about wildlife. Um, so we'll be welcoming Clayton Lamb. Um, and he'll be delivering a talk called Tales of Taking Evidence Through to Conservation Action for Two Iconic Mountain Dwellers, the Caribou and the Grizzly Bear. So he's involved in, in lots of really interesting work with lots of partners um, on pretty large scale, it should be a pretty interesting talk. So if you're not already registered, of course, go to our website or KCP's website um, for the registration. And if you miss it and you want to catch it, we have the, we'll have the recordings posted as well as this one. So we'll get it up within um, a few days. And um, let us know what you think of the series. We'll, we'll um, provide an opportunity for you to weigh in on how you think the series has been and any suggestions for what we might tackle in the future. Um, thanks for the engaging discussion. And Eric, thanks so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and, and your experience. Very much appreciated. Thanks, everybody. And it's easy to find me uh, through the Community Forest uh, website, uh, Google search, uh, whatever. So I'm happy to follow up with anyone who wants to follow up directly. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks. That's all. We'll end it from here. Thanks, everybody.